to our brown bag series, which has been a little bit sparse this semester, but is going about is about to heat up, especially with today's uh, talk and next week's talk with uh, Professor uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Siegelbaum, who's talking about his um, memoir as well as probably some somewhat controversial comments on uh, on uh, the Ukraine crisis. Well, he's uh, going to be interesting, so I invite you all to join that. So today's uh, talk is by Scott Bohm from uh, Department of Romance and Classical Studies, Professor of Spanish, and his topic is Cruel Allegories of Capitalist Crisis in Spain, Horror Film, Cultural Trauma, and Allegorical Realism. So take it away, Scott. All right, well, thank you. Um... Norm and uh, everyone who showed up. Uh, I know our time is, is limited and I appreciate you taking the time out. Um, as I was saying before, it's a great opportunity for me to, to share uh, my, my book project and, and the title, the original title and description that you all received is, is basically looking at one of the chapters in that book, which we will get to. Um, but as I was preparing the, the presentation, um, I, th I thought, well, there's not too much, there's nothing as, as boring as listening to somebody give a close close reading of a couple of films that you haven't seen uh, for a long time. And so what I decided to do is um, uh, we'll give a shorter reading of, of those two films after walking through um, how I got to that reading and what I'm trying to do in the book that I'm, that I'm writing at, at the moment. Um, and so also, as I, as I said, uh, I am about to experiment with my first PowerPoint presentation here. So I think I'm able to share this. Okay, uh, just to make sure everybody can see this. Fine. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. All right. So we'll start here. Um, so my book project is uh, called Spanish Nightmares. And then the key terms uh, that Norm just read off are horror film, cultural trauma and allegorical realism. First two are probably quite familiar to you. Um, at, least the, at least the first one, uh, I'll get into cultural trauma in a second. Allegorical realism is a concept that I've been developing and you will see my, my definition in progress um, in a few minutes. Um, but I wanted to start here, even though we're all quite familiar. Uh, sorry, let me send a full screen. There we go. Um, we're all familiar with horror film. Um, I, I know that some people here uh, watch it frequently, others may not watch it very much at all. Um, but I wanted to uh, look at it very quickly and talk about its origins and, and stress one uh, component of horror that often gets overlooked, uh, ironically, in analysis of it, in academic analysis of it. Um, so if we look at the root um, of, of the word, we get these phrases such as to stand on end, hair raising, to tremble, to shiver. And all of these are pointing to uh, effects on the body. Um, and here you have a, a definition that's working with or in terms of affect, a recent uh, book uh, produced in, in, in our field in Spanish studies, Spanish uh, film studies and horror studies more broadly, that horror can generally be defined by the emotional state of threat, a feeling either directly attacked by the film uh, and the startle effect or by extrapolation and be alignment with the body on screen. So when viewers are watching a film and they see uh, protagonists or any character really um, who's under, under attack or, or under threat, um, there's not necessarily a, a conscious identification with them, but there's actually a physical um, effective connection or alignment uh, with them so that the pain that's experienced on other figures on screen is also simulated um, in within viewers. And I, I uh, will return to this uh, in a moment, but I wanted to start here because I, I'd like to highlight the fact that what I'm trying to do is incorporate this dimension of, of the genre, which is absolutely fundamental um, to it, into a socio-cultural and political analysis. Oftentimes, these two are kept completely separate. 
Um, and, and below this, we have a, another quote that's talking about horror and the, the, the history of horror film is essentially a history of anxiety in the 20th century. This was written in 2000. Uh, I focus on 21st century horror film in Spain. And I, I, I would say the statement holds true uh, for this century as well. And what we have here are basically two different approaches um, to the genre and thinking about the genre. Again, I'm trying to bridge a, a gap between them. And now I'm in a little bit of trouble because I didn't practice how to move <laughs> the PowerPoint. There we go. Um, cultural trauma, the next term. Uh, I spent a lot of time actually in thinking about how I wanted to, which term I wanted to use beyond just the simple word trauma um, to take it away from the personal into uh, a, a collective, but without using the term collective. Uh, other possible terms are national trauma, historical trauma. Um, and in fact, we'll, we'll see a, a book on horror film that, that uses that term, another book uh, uses national, this one uses historical. Uh, I wanted to focus on cultural because with the couple of the dramas that I'm looking at, which I'll talk about in a second, Franco's Repression and the Spanish Economic Crisis, those are the two um, main focus of, of, of the book. Uh, if, you, if you just think about Franco's Repression, for example, um, you, we could think about it as historical trauma, something that happened in the past, um, but that elides the, the present effects, the effects in the present, the legacy of that, and how some of that trauma is ongoing. If we think about it in terms of a national trauma, um, it's complicated because of the way that that trauma was directed or experienced by a portion of the, of the population within Spain, which also has complicated uh, relationship to, to national identity and nationalism. Um, so I settled on cultural trauma um, and I, I'm using a basis of another articulation of it for my own. And the basis of that has been articulated by Jeffrey Alexander, who's a sociologist. And, and his definition is that cultural trauma occurs when members of a collectivity feel they have been subjected to horrendous or a horrendous event that leaves indelible marks upon their group consciousness, making their memories forever and marking their memories forever and changing their future identity in fundamental and irrevocable ways. Um, I, I do like this definition for a few reasons. Um, one, it mentions a, a horrendous event, which is easy to link to horror, but um, what you see here is um, kind of a, a constructionist view of trauma. It'll, what that allows me to do um, in the way that it's articulated here is to say that when, when a group of people, a certain collectivity, um, decides and articulates that they have been subjected to uh, a horrendous event or a series of horrendous events in, in the case of the Spanish economic crisis, um, that that constitutes, that act uh, constitutes cultural trauma. Um, and so in the book, I pay a lot of attention to social movements that have sprung up in response to the cultural trauma experienced um, in conjunction with Francoist repression and the Spanish economic crisis. Uh, I'll briefly go over that in, in a minute. The third term, allegorical realism. Um, I'll break this down. So I'll start on the side of allegory, then we'll get to realism. Um, again, uh, thinking about etymology and coming from the Greek this time, uh, allos, other, different, uh, and then agora in Greek to speak or to speak publicly in the agora uh, and basically in the public assembly of, of Athens. Um, so one way, one formulation of this is that allegory speaks publicly otherwise. Um, what is it speaking otherwise to or against? Uh, I, I would say in, in terms of this book, what I'm thinking about are official, official discourses, um, what isn't said, um, what's kept out of the distribution of the sensible, um, if you want to think about this in terms of Rancière. Um, Allegory, as, as we'll see, um, is is pre presenting a different a different truth, a different type of um, record or archive of the present. I draw upon Walter Benjamin um, and his his concept of allegory, um, which is articulated through much of his work, but particularly in the origin of German tragic drama or Trauerspiel. Um, where he looks at Baroque mourning plays, which are focused on, focused on violence, cruelty, and death, themes that resonate very much with, with horror film. 
in which history is presented as a petrified primordial landscape. That's his interpretation of it, um, which goes against um, a non-historicist, uh, or well, not historicist, but a, a non-historical analysis of it, uh, in which basically critics of, of these morning plays or, or Travis Spiel were saying that they're, they're just bastardized versions um, of classical tragedy. What Benjamin does is, is say that, no, we need to take these seriously um, and we need to think about what they're doing in terms of their presentation of, of history, um, which he's, he says is encapsulated in the image of the death's head, which is a, an image that appears frequently on stage in, in these plays and, and, and in the text that he's analyzing. He contrasts that to the romantic symbol, um, uh, which is uh, transcendent and uh, an object of, of beauty, something to aspire to. We can also extrapolate from this, it resonates with ideas of historical progress, um, which he consistently writes against in, in other works. Um, so I'm drawing upon this, this idea of allegory. Um, which is different from searching for a one-to-one -one correspondence between characters and, and events that happen on screen um, and then what's happening in the world. I do do that um, at times, um, but the basis of where I'm coming from is, is this approach towards allegory and thinking about horror, horror film as a genre in, in these types of terms. Um, so in doing that, I am following in the footsteps of, uh, of a film scholar, Adam Lowenstein, who wrote a really groundbreaking work called Shocking Representation, Historical Trauma, National Cinema, and the Modern Horror Film. Um, and he, he uses um, these ideas of Benjamin to develop his concept of the allegorical moment. Basically, the allegorical moment are moments that he finds and identifies in different horror films in which there's a, he calls it, there's a collision between the image on screen, um, spectators, and, and history. Um, and, and so he starts the book talking about an example of a, of a soldier who's in a, in a grave and, and appears, and this is linked to the Vietnam War. Uh, he assumes that people make these connections. Uh, and, and so we have this, this allegorical moment that has the ability, uh, thinking along the lines of Benjamin, um, to, to shock the moment and to shock viewers into an awareness uh, of, of the trauma that's involved here, and then also to re reshape their ways of thinking about, about history. Um, I, I find this uh, concept really useful. It's something I build upon. Uh, there are certainly moments in, in many of the films that I look at that I would consider allegorical moments. Um, I have a few hesitations with the with the term as I've continued to develop my own approach, um, and and one of them is, I uh, well well I love Walter Benjamin and and I love horror film. I'm a little bit skeptical of the of the power, even if it is a, a weak messianic power, um, of, of horror film um, and of of viewers engagement on the level that he's he's articulating and theorizing. By the same token, when I do my allegorical realist uh, readings, um, I, I don't assume that other viewers will necessarily uh, be having the same viewer experience um, that I'm articulating. Um, but there's a certain degree of, uh, I think, mm, hopefulness in the genre and in cinema itself um, that I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to, to embrace. Okay, so we look at allegorical realism and the realism side. Um, I'm not gonna get into extensive debates about realism in cinema. I, I will in the book, but not right here. What I'd like to stress is that when I talk about realism, uh, I'm leaning on the Lacanian real. Uh, that's where I'm mainly drawing uh, the idea of realism from. Um, so we're not thinking about, um, you know, uh, the, the direct, an exact portrayal of the world as it is, um, you know, either through uh, ideas that documentary film can do that or, or a naturalist approach within cinema. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something very different. So the Lacanian reel as in contrast to the symbolic order um, that structures the world in which we live, uh, that establishes uh, rules, laws, um, social roles and functions, uh, provides a sense of security uh, and safety and order uh, 
uh, to the world in which he lived. Um, the, the real is another register in which all that is excluded from that is, is present. It exists outside of um, the sense of reality that is constructed through a symbolic order. Um, and you'll see here, you have Holbein's The Ambassadors here uh, to look at as, a, as I'm talking. And so uh, if you're not familiar with the painting, you can see at the bottom of the painting, there's a, there's a stain, which if you look uh, sideways at, uh, I don't know how it'll work on your computer screen, uh, it will reveal a, a skull, a death's head again. So there's this, this connection between um, Benjamin and Lacan who, who uses this painting uh, to, to explain. Uh, the real and, and other parts of his thought. Um, so the real, it, it is present. It's like a haunting presence. Um, it's interlocked with, with the symbolic, but it's not something that um, we think of when we think about our daily lives and reality, which is, which is constructed through the ways that symbolic law and order function. Um, so following Lacan, Zizek uh, finishes his, his Pervert's Guide to Cinema with the comment that if you're looking for what is more real than reality itself, look into the cinematic fiction. And so um, in terms of allegorical realism, what I am proposing is that if we look at certain types of horror film, not all horror film, but certainly the, the films that I, that I look at in the book, um, what we're getting, if we look the right way, um, is basically this this stain, this, this skull that's on, on the, the official image that tarnishes um, the power and authority um, and, and security of the figures in the, in the painting here. So this is the, the working definition that I have at the moment. Allegorical realism entails the figurative inscription of current cultural anxieties into nightmare scenarios, whose cinematic allegorization within the conventions of the horror genre stage frightful encounters with the culturally specific real that expose ideological fantasies and render emergent structures of feeling sensible to viewers. Um, just a comment here. Um, so structures of feeling com comes from Raymond Williams, um, basically founds cultural materialism. Um, I, I'll, this is a point where I'm trying to link um, the way that the horror genre works in terms of the body, affecting the body, um, affect that is produced through that experience um, to history. And I think Raymond Williams is one way to do that. I'll get to Lauren Berlant uh, at the end of the talk and she also draws upon him when she's thinking about uh, affect and political affects. But basically, if you're not familiar with the term, uh, structures of feeling is, in a, is a little bit uh, nebulous and slight, slightly vague, um, but purposely so in the sense that uh, what Williams means is, is that it's very difficult for us to conceive of what's emerging. So he thinks about culture in a very dynamic way in terms of uh, dominant culture, residual culture, and emergent culture. So structure of feeling is something that's associated with um, sort of the, the sense, the sensibility of the times uh, of the present and what's emerging in the present, which sometimes it's hard to put your finger on. Sometimes it's hard to label. Um, and that's why he, he uses the word feeling here um, because it's something that can be perceptible and, but also elusive um, and it's not personal, it's shared. Um, and one place in which we can see um, these affects, these feelings, um, and the fact that they are shared is through uh, art, uh, whether that's literature, cinema, um, plastic arts, whatever that may be. Uh, and so that's something that we'll look at through, through horror film. Um, in terms of my definition, I, I want to say one thing that um, this is a not necessarily at work or at play in all horror film, as I said before. In addition to that, it can be a conscious, an unconscious, or a subconscious process, uh, in the sense that the you know the directors, the screenwriters, the people who are putting together um, uh, sets and 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 cinematographers who are thinking about framing, they might might not be thinking about this at all, or they may be. Um, and also, the films themselves may manifest and appear as straightforwardly liberal or leftist, progressive. Uh, or conservative, reactionary. Um, they, they might fall on one or two of those sides of the spectrum, 
or they could be full of political contradictions, which, which is often the case. Examples that are not related to my book, that we, but that we might all be familiar with, um, it, even if we haven't seen them, at least with the titles. Um, so I'd say uh, Get Out and A Quiet Place are two really good examples, kind of two sides of the same coin where um, I'm not going to go into descriptions of them now, but you have Jordan Peele, who's uh, obviously very conscious about what he's doing in terms of thinking about um, you know, race relations, racial tensions, um, anxieties about race uh, in the in the post Obama years, or even the, the Obama era. Um, and he's really thinking about this in terms of how does this play out? How do legacies of slavery play out um, within a white liberalness um, under Obama? So if you've seen the film, I, I think that will will make sense to a certain extent. Um, and I think we would agree that this would fall on a on a leftist liberal progressive um, side of, of the political spectrum. Quiet Place, if, if you haven't seen it, uh, I believe the second one just came out, um, would be the flip side of that, um, where the director um, was, was really shocked at some of the interpretations of the film, uh, where you have a white family in rural farmland, probably in Iowa, which is where the writers, the screenwriters are from, um, who's threatened by these, you know, unhuman monsters uh, and they have to be quiet because they're attracted to to sound um, and so they're basically the family terrorized by these monsters and they have to keep quiet uh, so the director himself is thinking that this film is all about parenthood and when it comes out critics um, many critics deride it for its 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 gun culture and how it plays into very conservative ideas of whiteness and whiteness under threat um, and you're know, thinking about political correctness and who can speak and who can't also in the, in the Obama or post-Obama era. Um, and then how that also uh, merges or has something to do with, a, with an emergent structure of feeling related to Trumpism. Um, this film comes out in 2018, uh, not long in terms of uh, cinematic production time after Trump's uh, election. Okay, so in the, the book, the way that this plays out in the first half of the book, I look at um, allegorical realism and how it plays out in terms of front, the cultural trauma related to Frank West repression, which is not a singular thing. It has many dimensions. Um, and so just quickly, you, you can see um, that I talk about displaced allegories of Spanish fascism in, in a set of films. In every chapter, I talk about two films in particular and relate them or in detail and I relate them to to other films when, when they also appear along the same lines. And in most cases, there are more than two. Um, uncanny allegories of enforced disappearance. Um, El Orfanato is the film that really sparked my, my dissertation and, and my long journey down to this book uh, many years ago. Bodily allegories of the transition. Um, La Piel Que Habito might be a film that people are familiar with since it was made by Pedro Almodovar. I'm not going to go into descriptions of all of these. I just want to show you what I'm what I'm doing. And then on this second half of the book, and this is where we're going, um, cruel allegories of, of eviction um, related to the Spanish economic crisis. So the two films uh, that we'll talk about briefly today, Mi interest duermes and Sequestrados, uh, in in opposite order, and um, and and then anthropophagic allegories of austerity, so cannibalism, um, which suddenly appears at the same time that austerity measures uh, have been implemented in Spain. But this is a new occurrence in, in Spanish cinema and Spanish horror. Um, and then demonic allegories of, of sovereignty, um, which I will look forward to, to talking about at another date, hopefully. Um, so what's at stake in, in Spanish nightmares? Before we get into uh, analysis of these films, and I'm gonna show you the trailers for, for these two films uh, before we do that. But what's at stake in, in the book and this project? Uh, first of all, it's an intervention in Spanish film studies uh, and scholarship on Spanish horror in general. Um, the, in the first part, um, over the past 10 years, there, there have been uh, several books published on the topic, which was not the case when I started my dissertation. There was uh, literally you know, almost nothing that it had been published um, about 10 years ago. And then um, Spanish horror film was the book that, that really changed that. There had been chapters in, in, in a couple of books, but uh, not a monograph. There have been some since. So I, I see myself as contributing um, to the 
the integration of horror film into Spanish film studies, which had often left it out, um, mainly because of this, this division between high and low culture and, and the popular culture. And then more importantly, I would say the scholarship on Spanish horror, which has focused mainly, uh, including some of these monographs on, on the first boom in Spanish horror that occurred in the late 1960s, early 70s uh, under Franco. Um, it's focused on fan culture. It's focused uh, sometimes on the post-national. Um, and to break that down, uh, and, and I, I'd like to say in terms of all of these things, there's nothing wrong with any of these approaches, including the post-national, but one of the effects of a post-national approach in the way that it's been uh, undertaken within Spanish film studies is to really stress how uh, Spanish directors, and, and it's often thought about in a generational way, so a new, a new wave of Spanish directors who are responsible for the, the current boom in Spanish horror um, that, that I look at as well, um, what they're doing basically is indigenizing uh, Hollywood genres, and uh, they're 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 inspired by what's happened in Hollywood. They're inspired by uh, genres that originate in Hollywood and have become global, international, and then they're they're putting their 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 national or their Spanish or their Catalan um, uh, background and and drawing upon the cultural motifs and histories related to these identities in the films that they're producing. Uh, I agree with that, but also if that's the focus or even an obsession, um, it relies often upon the idea of, of authorial intent uh, or auteurism, uh, which is the next thing mentioned here, um, which I, I critique and has been criticized uh, for decades at this point. Um, and it also uh, de-emphasizes the political content of the films just generally speaking. Uh, another thing that's happened in horror film studies, and, and I myself, I would say, um, have been trying to not reproduce this and have been guilty of to a certain extent in the past. It was, I, I would call it non-methodological allegorical readings. Um, and you know, a lot of my early work, I would say, would fall under that category. Um, I often was walking, working under uh, what you might call intuition, sort of guided, by psychoanalytic approaches, thinking about Benjamin and allegory, um, having Raven Williams in mind at all times, um, but not really being very systematic or conscious about how I was going about my readings. Um, that isn't to say that those readings by myself and, and others, because I'm not the only one who, who's taken this approach uh, to Spanish cinema, although it's usually looking at isolated films individually in an article or a chapter. Um, uh, oftentimes the conclusions uh, I find valid and convincing, but uh, because they're not uh, presented in a, a very methodological way or even a very theoretical way, um, even that's not to say there isn't a theoretical or theory behind it, but it's often not demonstrated. Um, it can lead to the easy and quick dismissal uh, of those sorts of readings as being idiosyncratic um, or whimsical, um, or uh, even, you know, sort of, uh, what, what's the word? Uh, uh, I, losing a word <laughs> that I wanted to say, just crude, basically, um, as well. So I, I think what I'm trying to do in the book is to work out a way in which uh, I, I'm, I'm showing, showing the work um, in, in one sense, but also trying to to draw upon and synthesize various ways of, of various approaches towards the genre, uh, integrate them into a, a methodological approach um, to, to reading them and interpreting them. Uh, the book's also an intervention in global film studies and scholarship on horror film in general. Um, and mainly this is in the sense that uh, Spanish cinema uh, is usually not incorporated into what we might think of as global film studies. Uh, there, there's exceptions, uh, the situation has improved, but oftentimes, um, at, at least outside of a European context, Spanish cinema, just generally speaking, uh, is, is not given the same sort of weight or considered to the same extent as, as other European cinemas um, in particular. And, and also this plays out in terms of horror film as well. And I'd like to mention Alan Lowenstein's, uh, Adam Lowenstein's book once again, because in, in Shocking Representation, one thing that he does is he looks at different cases of historical trauma uh, 
um, in countries such as the UK, Japan, Germany, uh, the United States that are related to traumas such as World War II, the Holocaust, uh, the atomic bomb, and the Vietnam War. Um, of course, there are many countries left out uh, in, in his analysis, but one of them is Spain. Um, and the traumas associated with the Spanish Civil War, the Franquist dictatorship, um, haven't really been given the same sort of attention, uh, generally speaking, and, and also within world history, um, but certainly within film studies and, and, and horror film studies. Um, so I'm trying to, to make an intervention in that regard. And um, also the Spanish economic crisis, the dimensions of which are are quite horrendous and, and monstrous um, is often overshadowed by by the situation in in, in Greece, which was uh, worse in many ways, um, but particularly in the United States, uh, received much greater attention. Uh, I'd say more importantly, what I'm trying to do with the book is it's a theoretical attempt to bridge the divide between effective and sociocultural approaches to horror film analysis by recognizing the historical production and political dimensions of effective atmospheres um, that would relate to structures of feeling that are translated into nightmare scenarios. And, and doing this provides an archive, I think of the present when we're talking about films that are just coming out and of recent films. Um, at this point, the first films I look at came out almost 20 years ago at this point which doesn't feel that far away, but it also provides a, an archive of the, of the recent past um, that is an alternative archive uh, to official records and statistics. Um, it gives us a sense, looking at horror film, gives us a sense of, of what was going on uh, and what it felt like uh, under the radar, under the official record. And this, this corresponds to ideas that Benjamin has as well in terms of, in terms of history. Okay, so shifting towards what I would, where I'd like to go, and the two films that were were advertised for the talk, um, just a little bit of background on the Spanish economic crisis. And here, I think we have a good example of what I just said. So there's a lot of ways I could talk about this. Uh, if I had more time, I could go into more detail. Uh, I could uh, provide a, you know narratives of what these look like. I could give you more examples, but. Um, but at this point in time, one of the ways that we, we would look back at the Spanish economic crisis, um, this one that starts in 2008 in conjunction with the, grant, the Great Recession, um, not the current one uh, that we have, um, we might look at that in statistical terms. So in, in 2012, there were 526 evictions a day. For, for a country the size of Spain, that's, that's massive. Um, there, there was also an 11% spike in suicides. Uh, suicides uh, become the, the leading cause of uh, violent death that overtakes car accidents during the course of the crisis and has stayed there since. Uh, of course, not all of it that can be attributed to the crisis itself, but studies have uh, suggested that some of that increase can be attributed uh, to the crisis itself. Uh, and certainly uh, outside of, of you know, professional studies and, and the like, uh, culturally speaking, uh, the relationship was clear. Um, in 2013, the unemployment rate stood at 27%. The youth unemployment rate was at 56%. Both of these are some of the highest rates in the, in the world, the youth unemployment rate in particular. In 2014, which is the date um, that the crisis officially ended, um, there were 800,000 children below the poverty line, which was an 8.3% increase from 2008 when the crisis began. And then in 2017, Spain became the EU country with the highest level of inequality. Uh, it no longer has that status, but it did for several years and levels of inequality um, uh, were, were exacerbated uh, during the crisis. And it still is one of the, one of the countries with the highest level. Okay. Um, now what I'd like to do is leave the PowerPoint for a minute, rejoin you briefly, and then I'd, I'd like to show you the trailers for these two films. Um, and I'll do this fairly quickly, but just a little bit of setup before you see the film. So basically uh, the two films that, that I'd like us to look at here are called uh, Sequestrados or Kidnapped and Mientras Duermes, uh, which is translated as um, sleep tight in English. 
And so in the first, basically we have a home invasion. And there are three nameless thugs basically um, who invade very early in, in the film, uh, the new home that a upper class family has just purchased on the outskirts of Madrid in an exclusive uh, neighborhood uh, outside of the city center. And uh, about 10 minutes into the film, um, they, they, um, they're, they're subjected to what's called an express kidnapping in which the, the kidnappers, it's three against three, they invade the home um, and then they try to extract as much wealth and money through withdrawals from ATMs uh, as possible in a short period of time, uh, basically overnight. Um, and, and that's what the film documents. It does it in 12 long takes, um, which really does heighten its cinematic realism um, and the, those affective effects. Um, the film also doesn't give you a lot of space to think, um, so you're subjected um, basically to, to this experience on, on your own body as a viewer. Um, it's quite cruel. Uh, it's quite brutal. Uh, it's very unpleasant in terms of the affects that it, it, it produces. Every time I see it, I feel sick to my stomach. Um, it transforms what is a luxurious um, house into a virtual prison um, and torture chamber. Um, and because of this sort of cinematic directness, um, we don't, we don't have time to think and we, we are somatically or haptically identified um, with, with the victims here. Uh, I just mentioned that because this is a fundamental difference between the two films. So I would like to show you the trailer for this film. So you can have a sense of what it, what it feels like. Oh, didn't realize I was sharing my screen the whole time. So you can see it's a mess. Um, okay, here we go. <laughs> Si estás tranquilo, tus chivas están bien. Si no, se muere. Por favor, no quiero ver la cara. Vamos a ir fuera. No voy a salir con la capucha en la cabeza. Saca las tarjetas de crédito y apunta los números. Debe hablar con alguien que se ayuda o hacer alguna tontería. Llamamos por teléfono. No. Ahora quiero por esto tan tarde, pero han llamado quejándose por los ruidos. Siento mucho haber molestado a los vecinos. I'm not, I'm not sure if you were able to hear that. I hope you were. Um, okay. Um, if, if there's any doubt, uh, the family doesn't survive. Uh, they're, they're all killed uh, throughout the course of the evening due to their various attempts to, to escape. Um, the second film that I'd like to just give you the setup for and then we'll watch the trailer as well. So I'd like you to see these uh, in close combination with each other. Um, basically, we have a situation where there's a, a, an apartment building in, in Barcelona in the, in the city center in this case, um, that's in an upper class neighborhood as well. And the doorman or the portero, um, who, or the super who takes care of the, the apartment uh, complex, 
and is, is at the entry entryway um, and has keys to all the apartments. Um, Sesa, he uh, has a, a existential problem in that he can't be happy. Um, and basically his goal is to wipe the smile off uh, his, his antagonist's face because we see the film through his point of view the whole time, which is a perverse move by, by the director. Um, so we're forced to identify with him throughout the film, even though we may uh, switch our identification throughout the film. When Clara, um, the object that he's trying to, um, to, to make unhappy, um, uh, is subjected to, to his nightly terrors. So what he does is he sneaks into her apartment at night um, before she gets in and he hides underneath the bed and then he comes out, um, drugs her basically on a nightly basis and then sleeps in the bed with her, um, but also terrorizes her in, in numerous ways throughout the film. Uh, in an attempt to um, uh, take remove the optimism that, that you'll see in, in the trailer um, that she exudes uh, away. No? Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of subplots and, and he, he does smaller acts of, of cruelty or commits smaller acts of cruelty throughout the film to other characters in the film, other tenants in the apartment building. But the main, the main focus is Clara. <clears throat> Se divierta. Buenos días, señorita Clara. Parece cansada. Ay, joder, César. Tú sí que sabes tratar a una mujer, ¿eh? Siempre con esa sonrisita. <risa> todo bien, todo genial. Clara en el ascensor. ¿Qué le has dicho? ¿Te preocupa? ¿No será que ella ya no sabe nada? Tú sabes que nunca había llegado tan lejos con nadie. Por primera vez en mi vida tenía una razón para vivir. Tengo referencias tuyas. Parece que no duras mucho en los trabajos, ¿no? El tarado es el de los mensajes. Sigue molestándola. ¿Y tú cómo sabes eso? Tengo entendido que usted tiene la llave de todos los apartamentos. Sí, como conserje tenía acceso al llavero. ¿Qué pasa algo? Las cosas se están complicando. Creo que ha llegado el momento de empezar en serio. Allá vamos, Clara. ¿Qué le has hecho? Pero que lo ha dicho el médico, joder. Bueno, ¿cómo que le crees? ¡Ah! ¿Sabes por qué te lo cuento? Porque quiero que sepas de lo que soy capaz. Okay. Um, and so in this film, also the resolution um, is that uh, she saw uh, a scene, a fragment of a scene. Uh, Cesar ends up killing uh, Clara's boyfriend and staging it as a suicide. Uh, he also um, rapes her without her knowledge and ends up impregnating her. The film ends uh, with her leaving the, the apartment and then going to another location by the sea. She has the baby and then she receives the letter from Cesar because she believes that the child was um, from her from her partner. Uh, he makes it clear that it was not. Um, and finally, uh, we get a, a, a the second instance of a smile um, from Cesar, from, from the doorman. And we do see the smile wiped off of Clara's face. Um, so in both cases, what we have here um, are people either forced forced out of their their homes, uh, or they're not given a chance uh, to to enjoy and to live out their their fantasies of what it would mean to 
to buy a bigger house and and move out to a luxurious neighborhood in, in Madrid. I need to go back to the PowerPoint, just one second. Okay. okay, so if we look at so if we look at sequestrados kidnapped um, and we compare it to this definition of allegorical realism. Uh, what, what do we get so if allegorical realism in, involves the figurative inscription of current cultural anxieties and, and current, I mean, at the time of production or release. Um, what are those anxieties that are related to the crisis? And at this point, um, there's the sudden emergence of the crisis, um, the collapse of the housing bubble in Spain, uh, and the increase in, in evictions, uh, the dramatic increase in evictions that grows after this point, but it's already happening. Uh, into nightmare scenarios, uh, the scenario is a home invasion uh, linked to an express kidnapping. Frightful encounters with a cultural specific real. Um, so the, the the thugs, they are definitely Albanian thugs. One is the Spaniards, it's working in conjunction with them, but it's clear that there is this outside threat um, that's registered in very problematic, xenophobic way, um, but also is culturally specific. And then uh, the film also ex exposes ideological fantasies uh, through this traumatic encounter with the, with the real. Um, that are linked to this I, this concept of, or, or the slogan uh, that that España va bien, um, which pre predates the film, um, but uh, goes hand in hand with the the economic boom and the housing boom uh, under Jose Maria Aznar when he was president in the mid to late and late '90s and early 2000s. Um, clearly, uh, that fantasy no longer um, is sustainable by the end of this film. Um, and it also gets into this idea of home ownership that was also sold to the Spanish people um, prior to Athenar, but certainly um, much more so under him and was continued then under the socialist government of, of uh, Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero, um, who was president at the time uh, that these films come out. Um, so all, all the hopes and dreams that are associated with, you know, sort of the, the Spanish dream or, you know, the Spanish version of the American dream at this point in a neoliberal um, growing, rapidly growing economic uh, context and society that had, had embraced its integration into Europe, um, into the EU, and the, the economic benefits that was supposed to bring. At this, at this moment, it's, it's produced uh, that, and those fantasies have, have uh, been very sustainable and supported by material conditions. When the crisis arrived, that suddenly uh, comes to a halt. In terms of the structure of feeling, uh, or an emergent, emergent structure of feeling, um, that is registered here. What do we have? We have shock and, and in the trailer you see the, the first uh, instance in which the intruders uh, break through the, the window and it really is a shocking scene because it disrupts a, a very domestic melodramatic um, uh, scene uh, with, a, with a very violent sudden uh, act of violence. Vulnerability, um, and this is something that's felt throughout the film on the bodily level. Um, that's also experienced by viewers. And then precariousness, uh, which we can think about in terms of the, the production of the precariat as a class, but here it's more as a, a structure of feeling, uh, widespread precariousness that, that almost functions uh, well, as a virus, you know, that it can spread throughout society and, and could touch anybody, that nobody's protected uh, or, or safe from it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, cruelty, brutality, um, these sorts of things. Now, if we turn to me interest awareness, the tight, uh, we have the, the same cultural anxieties here, the crisis, which isn't rendered in a, in a sudden dramatic fashion. Uh, instead, here it's, it's a creeping um, force that um, eventually, eventually appears. Um, but this, the warning signs that something very dangerous is happening are ignored by, by Clara. Um, or at least she's not able to attribute the, the cause, uh, which should be fairly evident, um, but she, she's blinded to that. Uh, into nightmare scenarios, again, we have a home invasion here, um, but it's linked to, to a, a stalking situation. 
um, frightful encounters with a cultural specific real. In this case, it's a it's a, El Portero as a as a psychopath. Um, one scholar who has written on this film uh, briefly mentions El Portero also as sort of an anachronistic uh, figure, a holdover from the Francoist era, um, which also makes it a little bit more culturally specific. Um, and then it exposes ideological fantasies, um, similar to the other film, but more specifically here, I would say, uh, instead of Athanar's slogan, uh, what became, um, I think unwittingly, but what became a slogan of, 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 of the second um, term of, of Zapatero is that there no hay crisis, no? There's not a crisis, no? Um, we're not in crisis. Um, it is not until 2010, uh, May of 2010, is the first time that Zapatero recognizes that Spain is in a crisis. So he maintains this, uh, this fantasy. And, and actually, in, re in, in an interview many years later, um, when he's pressed on this um, and this failure to admit what was happening, he links this to his personal optimism as well. Um, so the other ideological fantasy at play here, I think embodied by Clara is that the, the world is a good place, basically. It's not a cruel place, it's, it's a good place and that it works, um, at least for Clara and, and the people in the apartment building too. Structure feeling, again, we, have, we do have shock, we have vulnerability, precariousness, cruelty, those, those would be the same. Um, so what are the conclusions? If we look at these two films and think about them in terms of patterns, um, one thing that they produce, the effect that they produce is that cruel optimism is annihilated. Uh, this is drawn from Lauren Berlant. A relation of cruel optimism exists when something you desire is actually an obstacle to your flourishing. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, in Zapatero's comments, um, and then also in Clara's situation, we see this, that they, they hold on to, a, to an idea um, or, or a desire um, and an object that is no longer able to produce uh, or fulfill their, their expectations and their desires. We have a dramatiz dramatization of the violence necessary to break free from ideology. Um, so these are very violent, cruel films. Um, uh, there's a way that we can link this to an analysis that Zizek provides of a 1980s film called They Live, in which there's a, a really long drawn out uh, fight scene um, that seems to uh, really work in terms of demonstrating how how hard it is uh, to break free from ideology and how there's a certain violence necessary in order to do so. Class conflict is illuminated in both of these films. Um, the protagonist identities, uh, they're different, but they're both associated with different upper class identities. The first is more related to uh, conservative uh, business culture, uh, Partido Popular, uh, Spanish uh, conservative traditionalism. And then in the second case, Clara, I would say, is more associated with, with sort of the upper class socialist uh, pro gray or progressive uh, type. Um, and the point of view here is really important in the interest of awareness because we are, we are on the side of Cesar, um, which again, as I said before, is very perverse. Um, position to put the viewer in, but it also illuminates this class conflict. And we can't help but feel sympathy for him and his plight uh, at certain points, and, and even fear for him being caught uh, against our will in, in certain points. But there's a certain pleasure um, that we can't entirely escape. Uh, revenge capitalism is on display. I, I pull from uh, Max Haven, who just wrote a book uh, called, with that title. And he starts that book by saying, when you live in someone else's utopia, all you have is revenge. And uh, since we are all living in capitalism's utopia, um, <laughs> I think we don't have much else to do unless we can think of some kind of uh, other alternative. It tends to produce um, the sentiment or the affect, affects uh, associated with, with revenge. And I think we see that really clearly with, with Cesar and me interest awareness. No, he can't think outside. He can't think of anything else. No, this is capitalist uh, realism uh, on display. And then finally, uh, I think we can read into the violence, uh, financial terrorism, uh, which is a term um, that's been used by activists um, and, and also Yanis Varoufakis also in terms of the Greek situation and accumulation by dispossession, um, which David Harvey talks about in terms of thinking about how primitive accumulation uh, continues to occur in a, in a different way. So we, we, see, we see that um, very clearly in sequestrados. That's a lot, and that's about an hour. Um, that's what I have, so I will stop sharing. I don't know how much time people have for questions, but uh, I will stop.
talk. I think we have enough time. Uh, usually we go to one thirty if uh, okay. It's enough activity. Yeah, I was I wasn't entirely sure on that, so I, I was trying to go for forty five minutes. I went a little bit over, but if if anybody is able to stay, that'd be great. And if you can't, I completely understand. Okay. No, thanks for listening for almost an hour. So you can use your raise hands uh, option, or you can just. Raise your hand in person if you like. Yeah. Um, Scott, okay. you just, uh, I, I didn't see who went up first. I was taking a sip, but I'll go with Tony. Uh, thanks, Scott. I enjoyed this a lot. It's good. Always good to read and know. I read your book proposal, and this really put things together. I have two questions. Yeah. One is about terminology. Sure. And your talk. That's weird. Okay, uh, one's about terminology. You talk about allegory, yeah. and it seemed it seemed to me that you were describing then the result of the allegory. Allegory is it's cathartic. So, wh what's the distinction that you're making between allegory and catharsis? Or because clearly these clearly, I mean, with the trauma, with everything that's in the, the, that are in these films, they are cathartic. So, do you have a distinction there, or what's the what's the relationship? Okay. And you had a second point? The, no, no. And then my second question, and this is just out of curiosity, because yeah. um, how does public, how does reception theory, sure. how does that, that work in film studies and especially what you're doing? Sure. Um, because, you know, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. You know, you, you give, I mean, you give a really, just a, a really comprehensive analysis of what was produced but then mm -hmm. how does i guess basically how does reception theory fit into fit yeah. into your research okay. and your in your findings those are my two questions okay great thank you um i'll start with i'll start with that one um so um so in terms of film studies uh, just as a field um and you know my work i, I you know i basically come from a cultural studies background um, not from a, a standard film studies background, but uh, the turns, a couple of turns within film studies are one is to reception theory and that sort of that approach um, as a dominant approach or almost an exclusive approach. Um, and that's been used within Spanish studies in terms of looking in, at horror film in terms of fan culture and how it, how it intersects with, you know, fanzines and, and even internet cultures and and these sorts of things. So how are, how are these films consumed? What meanings are, are made from them and their circulation by, by fans more than anything? Um, and then the other, the other major turn within film studies is towards looking at production. Um, you know, and how, are these, how are these produced? How are they financed? Uh, and then I would even say that some of the emphasis on the, on the post-national um, within Spanish horror film studies in particular, also tends to focus on that a little bit, um, not to a large extent, but it does do that and also engages with reception theory to a certain to a certain degree, but more in terms of the intersection between these films within the film festival circuit um, and the Sitges uh, Fantastic Film Festival in Spain is one of the most important in the world. Um, and Filmax as a production company, um, which had a role in either the production or distribution of both of these films that we talked about here, um, that's also given a lot of space. Um, I do pay attention to the production uh, aspect to a certain degree um, as I'm introducing the films and making those connections because I think they're important. In terms of your broader question, um, it's it's not fundamental to my analysis. <laughs> I I I. I think there is a real need uh, within Spanish film studies to think more theoretically. Um, but I think there's a need to do that, in, especially when it comes to popular culture and to horror film, uh, based on what's been produced uh, to date, uh, to do it in a methodological fashion. And, and I, I am trying to do that. Uh, and I've been developing that approach, even from the book proposal that you've read. It's, it's uh, evolved uh, in, in the actual writing of it. Um, I, I don't think I have a choice but to do that because there's so much resistance to political readings of popular culture and horror film within the field 
it it's it's almost um what's the word um well, it calls attention to itself it's conspicuous and 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 i actually make the argument and i will make the argument in the introduction to the book um that it's a that's a, that in itself is a symptom of what's been theorized as the culture of the transition in spain and so there you can see how spanish scholars and even you know hispanists or, or you know people who work on spain can also be affected by uh culture of the transition really briefly would be a way in which uh, the, the the cultural the cultural products and the cultural analysis uh, that has happened since Franco's death basically and the, the political transition that took place after that death um, has produced uh, cultural products and analysis that's fairly apolitical um, that focuses on cohesion um, and and isn't really uh, being critical or, or political um, in ways in in which are very productive. And I think these films uh, are, are pointing the finger at ways in which ideas of the Spanish state and culture that's been produced out of the transition um, produces structural violence. So the other thing I guess I would say is that um, I, it's pretty striking to me when I read some of the work that's been produced by scholars in Spanish cinema um, at just the, the very, I said this before, the easy dismissal of any kind of politicized readings. Um, and so I, I, I think it relates to what I just said, but I, I, think, I think an intervention is called for. And um, the, 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 the flip side of that as well is that some of these, most of these films are not necessarily being uh, interpreted, if you look at critics, you know, not not academics, but critics, you know, uh, film critics, they're not necessarily coming up with these sorts of readings. There, I don't see evidence that says that, you know, there are masses of people or people who are involved in the social movements that I talk about in relation to these traumas that are also reading these films the same way. And in fact, I know from anecdotal, you know, conversations that I've had with people in the historical memory movement, they don't make the connections that I make between that movement and El Orfanato, for example. You know, I, I know that for a fact. They don't see themselves represented in the films. Um, and why is that? Well, there's a good reason why, because there's a distortion that takes place in this allegorization of the sort of affects and, and effective atmosphere that exists around that issue. And so they don't see themselves represented. It gets can, you know, reconfigured and distorted. So I think here, um, uh, there's a real role for cultural critique. And that's what I see my job as. <laughs> so I'm not a sociologist. Uh, I draw upon sociology and I, and I think about social movements and, and changes within culture in relation to art. Um, but my role I, I feel is uh, to be a cultural theorist and critic here. And that's how I, that's the contribution I can give. Your question about catharsis, I don't have a good answer for. So I've taken a note and maybe we can talk about it. Um, but if you have any thoughts uh, that, you know, I, do you have any inclinations or intuitions about that? No, I, th I think we could talk about it with some other time, but no, but I think we could work something out. Okay, all right. And yeah. it's just because, you know, you're just, it's what really drew me to it was, you know, you're, you're looking at the etymology of these words mm -hmm. and yeah, it, it just, it just, it was the same definition to the point okay. where I went to a, lit a dictionary of literary <laughs> terms. Oh. And so let's okay. talk about it. Okay, let's talk about it, yeah. That sounds good. Thank you. Thanks for your questions, Tony. Isaac. So um, I had a question. I was really struck when you were talking about sequestrados, especially at how it is culturally relevant to Spain in particular. Mm -hmm. And it um, reminded me a lot. I haven't seen the film yet, but it reminded me a lot of The Strangers, which came out in the United States around the same time. Are you familiar with that film? I am, yeah. And um, what struck me about it is that, um, I mean, The Strangers is more cultural than the United States, obviously, and mm -hmm. but a lot of the same yep. ideas of yep. challenging the, the, the supposed safety of um, upper class, although in that case, more pastoral settings. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about the um, yeah. transnational kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. No, thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, that's, that's something I, that's included in the chapter, but I didn't include here. Um, yeah, so there's actually been a slew of home invasion films 
um, and like the past five or six years, or maybe maybe even a little bit more now, the past ten years. Um, and so, uh, so there's a bunch of them that come out in the late '70s, early '80s, and that we can tie to the sort of the the, uh, the rise of neoliberalism, Reagan, Thatcherism. Um, and so, this is one thing that happens at that moment, in that particular moment. Uh, then it does kind of go away. Um, Funny Games, um, which uh, Michael Haneke's film. Uh, classic and something that really launches him and it's just been remade that he he went to Hollywood and redid it in English. Um, then that appears in the mid 80s, which is really a critique of, you know, gratuitous violence and violent culture and violent representations within Hollywood in the original and, and, in, and in the remake, which I haven't seen the remake actually, um, but I've seen scenes from it. That's that actually is used in sequestrados. There's a lot of sequences and staging that's used. It's very similar. You know, they're, they're nodding to the film. Um, that's the film that's really, um, you know, said to launch uh, the subgenre. Basically, I would say that uh, the the home invasion films in the U.S. context. I haven't seen most of them, um, but I'm aware of all of them, um, and I and I should see uh, more as I'm writing this chapter. Actually, they're just very unpleasant to watch. <laughs> Um, I don't, I did not, I, I do not enjoy these films actually, um, even though it seems like I might, but I don't. Um, I think they are tied to some of the same processes and they are, they are tied up with the, the idea of uh, extensive widespread and growing precarity on a global level. Um, maybe not so, so closely tied to the economic crisis, but definitely as an effect of that, um, for sure. And they take a variety of forms and they play out, you know, with different cultural, um, you know, uh, motifs, archetypes, uh, these sorts of things that are different from how it plays out in Spain. We don't get a lot of characterization in sequestrados. It's very immediate, very direct. It, it really puts you in a situation in which it's happening to you because we don't learn much about the characters and it just happens immediately. And there's, and it doesn't let up with those long takes. This is only 12 takes. It's a 96, 93 minute film with 12 long takes, which is very claustrophobic and you don't get out of the situation. Um, that's a little bit different in some of the home invasion films produced in the US. Um, so yeah, they, they're, so there's some cultural specificity in how they uh, stage these particular scenarios, but you're absolutely correct. And it's something that I do talk about in, in this chapter, um, but we can link them up to this larger process. The Great Recession didn't, didn't only happen in Spain, it happened you know, in most parts of the world and growing precarity tied to neoliberalism uh, is also happening as globalization continues. Great question. Yeah. Elizabeth? Hi. Yeah, thanks. That was really interesting. I learned a lot. I think I might actually watch uh, Sleep Tight tonight. Interesting. I don't know if it's a good uh, idea. <laughs> but maybe this afternoon. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, so I have like one kind of more um, intellectually oriented question than more sure. just like personal curiosity question. Okay. Um, so I, you kind of mentioned, you know, like obviously the crisis doesn't affect everyone equally, as you mentioned, you know, based on all kinds of factors, you know, I'm assuming in Spain, like regionalism, you mentioned like the youth unemployment rate, and then obviously, you know, factors like gender and race. Um, so I guess I was kind of wondering, like, what about horror might or, or like, does it allow the expression of those inequalities? Like, so the, like the idea of the cultural trauma being sort of like a national trauma and then the idea of how that then gets expressed, you know, through particularities. And if there's something about horror that maybe allows that like uneven impact mm -hmm. to be felt differently, uh, particularly in Spain. Yeah. Or right. if it does or how it does, yeah. Right. Right. And then the, that, that's the more intellectual question. Okay. And then the other one I'm just curious about is, um, did you, I, cause this is a genre I'm wholly unfamiliar with. So I'm just <laughs> kind of interested. Um, I, but I just recently saw a Spanish horror movie for the first time in my life, which was The Platform. Yeah, right. Which and is one of the most the, popular uh, film. Yeah, yeah. The, the whole capitalist critique. I mean, obviously it's like kind of beating you over the head with it, but just yeah. curious if you'd seen it, if you see that fitting into anything here. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a conclusion of the book, actually, is that film. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was good, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, if, if you haven't seen the film, then, then basically, I think about it 
it, it became like one of the most popular films in the world in the very early stage of the pandemic. And, and one of the reasons for that is the claustrophobia and, the, and the, the constructed situation, you know, people being confined and then basically an experimental prison situation. Uh, I won't go into all the detail, but um, um, so it resonated and it just happened to land on Netflix at, at, the, at that time. So there's a, sort of a synergy that occurred there. But, uh, but as you say, um, it's very much about economic inequalities and, you know, um, cruelty and, and all these sorts of things. So yeah, I do. I, I haven't written the conclusion, but I will. And then I also, I also, I also do link that to COVID too. In in terms of it, it's a good example of uh, you know here's a film. You hear it's a chicken and the egg sort of thing. Um, so you know in most cases in, in the chapters, I'm laying out you know what's one dimension of Franco's repression or one dimension of the crisis. And then films that appear very close in time uh, to those particular aspects of those cultural traumas. It's really curious how, how it plays out. So you have these home invasions in the first phase of the very early initial period, and then it shifts and they disappear. And then you have a bunch of cannibals all of a sudden. Um, and so you have the, the, the first wave that's like a tsunami of the crisis that comes in this really violent, sudden, direct fashion. It's being denied officially <laughs> by the president. And then you have the implementation of, of mass austerity that happens. And, and then you have these films and it's cannibalism. So it's like, well, what does this feel like? What does austerity feel like? What does this crisis feel like? What, what affects are produced by it? In the case of, of the platform, it's reversed because the film's made before the pandemic breaks, but it appears almost simultaneously. And so here we have the case of, you know, a film that embodies an emergent structure of feeling, you know, even before it emerges really. Um, and, it, but it resonates, it resonates and it registers those things. And that's one of the reasons that explains its success. You know, I mean, it is a good and scary film. You know, it does something interesting with the genre, but would it have been that popular if we were not in lockdown? Probably not, you know, probably not. Yeah. Uh, your other question is really interesting. Um, like Tony's, I have to give it some more thought. Um, my initial my initial thought is that it doesn't do that too much, and certainly not directly. And oftentimes, I think we're invited to think about the protagonists, and and often we're often victims in the films. Not always, though. Um, you know, as sort of a universal Spanish figure, and that's really problematic. Um, because most of them are, you know, most of the films are, not all, but most of them are located in Madrid. You know, most of them are not um, actors who um, come from the peripheries, or if they are, that's not accentuated or accented in their portrayals of the characters they're portraying. Um, so I, I think it's, it's also one of the reasons I wanted to stay away from, I mean, the word national in Spain is tricky. Um, it was one of the reasons I did that, but, um, I guess like I gave you an example of how I think the two films that you've seen the trailers for, they could be read as like, you know, sequestrados. This is, this is the Spanish national family. It represents all Spaniards and stuff. And it does invite you to do that to the extent that you don't have time to think when you're actually watching the movie. You're just, you're there and you're being affected. You know, um, you're being shocked continually. You have empathy for them because of that connection. And you can think about it. The crisis is coming. Anybody could be affected, but uh, or you know, or not think about it. But that's sort of the initial thing. But when you but when you look at it with in conjunction with other films, and particularly with *Me and Just Wearmas* in this case, and this is where patterns start to become evident, and that's where the sort of the criticism that this is an idiosyncratic reading or an allegorical reading that's just based on you know whims, that starts to break down if you can show you know patterns between films. Uh, and so in Me Interest Awareness, it's a very particular scenario too. And these class associations become undeniable. Um, and so you can, then you can step back in, in analysis, not, not as a viewer, but as a, as a cultural analyst and, and think these things through a little bit more. Um, you know, I think that leads us with, in this case, to think about ideas or, or affects related to revenge and how we might be sort of trapped uh, in, in that sentiment um, in the midst of a crisis without many viable alternatives. Um, but in other cases, that might play out differently. But that's a great question. It's something I'm, I will definitely need to pay, pay attention to. Um, but I would say most of the films are very sort of non-regionally specific and have a very- That's sort of, interesting. Uh, 
you know, Castilian nationalist uh, mm -hmm. orientation. Not all. Yeah, which that's that's but, super interesting in and of yep. itself. Like, what is that doing? So yeah, yeah that's, that's really exactly. fascinating. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Vlad? Okay, well, I just unmuted myself. Thank you for the presentation and for the answers. Thank you for being uh, here. Yeah. Uh, a very simple question. That's, uh, I know, um, that of uh, someone outside of this area of scholarship. I'm just curious um, how much, you know, a nightmare, or I guess, thrill in general, how is it? How much of it is a kind of kind of cosmopolitan experience? How, how much of it is a personal experience? In other words, can I get scared uh, kind of Spanish way, or yeah. uh, can I be, <laughs> if I'm let's say an Egyptian, yeah. can I be scared in a Polonic way? Yeah. Or can I get scared? <laughs> help me learn the language that I'm studying. If I, yeah, get scared that other way. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I appreciate that too. It's really good. And I like the articulation of it too. Um, that's really great. Um, well, I mean, I, maybe we can use Elizabeth's recent experience and her first incursion into Spanish horror here a little bit as an example. And, and I would say that, you know, like a film like The Platform, um, which is a Spanish film, but actually it's a Basque film. <laughs> if you really want to get technical. So, so there you go, there is, there, there, there is something different here at play. But in that film, um, you were in, a, I mean, I've only seen it once uh, about a year ago, um, but it, we're trapped in the same prison the whole time, basically. You know, it's a totally vertical space. We don't have an exterior. We might've got a couple exterior shots, but we're there pretty much the whole duration. We can't get out, we're confined. And so those sort of local or, you know, national or regional, um, markers are, are kind of not there. I mean, they appear, uh, the protagonist has a copy of Don Quixote, for example, you know, with him, you know, like they appear in the space, um, but it's sort of, those are sort of minimized. You, you can, and I think that's one reason it was a global hit, you know, not only because of the way it, you know, it, it was resonating with what was happening globally, but also it was speaking in, in, in a cosmopolitan language, if you want to put it in that way, or a cosmopolitan cinematic language, if you want to put it that way. Um, other films might be more difficult. I'm just kind of scanning my brain right now, which ones would be easier or not. But, but I guess the answer is you don't you don't need to you don't need to have to get scared in a Spanish way, but you could, <laughs> right? So Span now we get into a little bit of audience reception. Um, so I don't have a lot of data to back this up, but I would theorize that um, Spanish audiences. Um, and, and audiences within Spain from different regional identities are gonna read these films and understand certain things differently and specifically, and they're gonna get certain references that other, other people won't. But I didn't go into this, I had mentioned it and I kind of forgot, but um, I, I, I kind of didn't out, kind of just presented, there's a bunch of films that I'm looking at, but what I didn't highlight is that there has been what has been called the Spanish Renaissance uh, of the Spanish horror renaissance that, that began in the early 2000s and kind of peters out around 2010, but it's still sort of ongoing, um, just not at the same rate of production. That's a term that's not used in Spain. That's a term that was applied by, by Anglo-American critics um, to the set of films that comes out and gets international exposure um, because a few films, mainly because of Guillermo del Toro, which is very, very interesting who I discuss, but I don't analyze his films because I, he's coming from a very different context. So there you have a you know, Mexican director um, who makes two horror films in Spain set in a very Spanish context. So they're very explicitly about Franco's repression, very different from what we get from Spanish screenwriters and, and directors and producers. Um, but it kind of opens up because, of, because the films are so well made and because of him and his other cultural production in Mexico and in Hollywood it sort of brings Spanish cinema and Spanish horror cinema in particular to a, water, uh, to a wider uh, global audience, particularly in the United States and the UK um, and Japan. Um, there already was an audience in Latin America for it because obviously for linguistic reasons. Um, but that term I think is the indicator that you don't have to be afraid or get scared in a Spanish way in order to appreciate the films. But with the caveat, you know, uh, experiences might be slightly different um, from from those of Spanish viewers. You know, I'm just thinking. It's interesting to think about this. Uh, you know, if 
if fear is a is a defense mechanism, which which it is, like, like pain, yeah, place, right? It's it's interesting to think about it, what it takes to be properly scared, and whether some kinds of people have just broader register that one can play on to scare them, and whether it helps sure. them or not in different situations. I'm yeah. I'm you really off on a tangent here, but. No, 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 no. Yes. <laughs> great, great. See, what's interesting is that the line between horror and comedy is very, very, very thin. It's like razor sharp thin. But your question points to the fact that horror is much more translatable than humor and comedy. Like humor, the, lo the locality of, and the rootedness, the cultural rootedness of humor does, does not translate nearly as easily. So there's a bunch of Spanish comedies on Netflix right now. But I doubt they will, you know, they haven't been embraced. They haven't, they haven't received the same kind of reception, you know, just based on popularity that is documented as Spanish horror and a bunch of Spanish thrillers that kind of replace the Spanish horror boom. Right now that we're in a Spanish thriller boom. Um, those two cinematic, you know, genres and languages, you know, are much more translatable, I think, and circulate much easier than comedy. But the line between humor and comedy is really close. So that disparate, um, you know, uh, results are, are striking. So it's a tangent, but it's an interesting tangent. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. So we got about five minutes left. Maybe I can just uh, add a question so I'm not the only one that didn't <laughs> ask one. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I, you've touched on this and maybe, um, I didn't get your full explanation of it, or maybe you prefer just to dismiss it, but this question of intentionality, I think is, sure. is interesting, you know, when, especially when you started out with those two movies that uh, yeah. differ in terms of whether or not they're ideological or not, uh, Get Out, which clearly is, yeah. Yeah. and A Quiet Place, which I must confess when I watched it, yeah. um, I didn't think of the, Right, right. The ideological interpretation yeah. at all and it and, and when you talk about the fact that the framers of the movie didn't think it was ideological either that's very seems like that's a challenge in some sense for what you're doing to some degree i i'm not saying you can't interpret literature or movies or or other cultural manifestations yeah. in very interesting ways and that's part of the intellectual activity of it even if it wasn't intentional but it seems like that's kind of a little little problem i guess in some sense and well, before, it is yeah, yeah you get yeah. that just let me make one more yeah. suggestion if i can yeah uh, you say you're not an not a sociologist yeah uh, you're probably also going to say you're not an economist right right so, um this question of how you frame the the spanish crisis is really yeah. interesting in that respect um yeah. because there, you know, I teach the politics of international economic relations is one of my main courses every year. And we're always going through these debates about how you frame economic policy and the role of the state, you know, whether it's socialist or, or not, and the role of the market and so forth. And there, all I want to, I guess, warn you about in some sense yeah. is that there is this pretty large literature mm -hmm. that's critical of just the term neoliberalism and oh, how yeah. it's used, sometimes inappropriately they would argue, at least economists would. I, I don't fall right. into that category, but right. some of them would. Yeah. And so the, if you look at some of the writings of, um, of folks that are clo uh, criticizing um, globalization in particular, yeah. um, they sometimes seem to prefer the term market fundamentalism instead mm -hmm. of neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. So interesting if you, want to look at some of that literature at some point, I'd be glad to read it with you. <laughs> sure, some, sure. Some of it's really quite interesting. But yeah. Anyway, that, that's just a little segue that probably doesn't even belong in the discussion, but I thought I'd mention it. No, no, no. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it, I think so. Yeah, I mean, neoliberalism as a term gets attacked from all, all different angles. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I think uh, here I would I would think I would align myself a little bit with Wendy Brown um, and how she thinks about it. Uh, you know, I, I I do ascribe to David Harvey's you know interpretation of it and and what it entails, but I also you know there's some tension between his interpretation, Wendy Brown's interpretation, where she gets into well, how does this play out in terms of subjectivities and 
you know, um, in ways that we conceive of ourselves and then of the state and these sorts of things. So, um, yeah, I think I will continue to use it, but but you point my attention to the fact that I need to be uh, pretty intentional about how I use it uh, right up front. <laughs> so. yeah, just a little footnote saying that uh, there may be some controversy about this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, the question um, of intentionality, you're right, it is a, it is a problem for me, uh, in part because, I mean, I don't think it should be, actually. I mean, this, this kind of was settled, this kind of debate within literary studies was settled decades yeah. ago. However, <laughs> I kind of mentioned that I kind of got off track when I was talking to Tony, and I, I think this is sort of what I wanted to say, actually, was I've been very surprised at how um, two of the scholars who have monographs that deal with Spanish horror exclusively or, or in part um, have kind of, re they rely on when they, when they discredit, and particularly in one case, when they discredit any sort of politicized or allegorical readings, they rely on authorial intent or authorism within, within film studies. Um, as, as a defense, um, which I think is really, really <laughs> interesting and surprising because these are otherwise like, you know, they're good books, they're good scholars. Um, but, uh, you know, I think they're relying that on that as a, def as a defense, actually. Yep. Bye. Thank you, Elizabeth. As a defense mechanism, actually. But, but you're right. Uh, it is an issue. Now, there's precedent for this issue within uh, horror films. So, and I, and I do write about this in the introduction. So Night of the Living Dead at this point has acquired culturally kind of accepted politi politicized and allegorical readings. That came out in 1975, I think. That doesn't sound old enough, but I think that's right. Um, but anyways, decade, many decades ago, yeah, uh, the, the original, um, but, or maybe it was 1968, actually I can't remember, late 60s, early 70s, uh, I'm just drawing a blank, but, but anyways, at the time of its release, Romero, who now embraces those meanings uh, and then went on to make versions that are very more consciously aware of what he's doing, uh, you know, along the lines of Jordan Peele now. Um, at the time, he rejected, he rejected those interpretations. And uh, I was like, I wasn't thinking about those things. I just wanted to make a horror movie. We didn't have a lot of money and this is what we did. Um, and in some ways, it's the best example uh, of how this how this can happen, and how our own, you know, our, our own intents or, or, or our own uh, visions uh, are not our own, you know, that uh, and that we're always drawing from a cultural, you know, uh, effective atmosphere to use that term again, um, and and you know, historical realities uh, that exist, and, and you know, when you think about zeitgeist, you know, these come together in a work of art. And then they reveal, you know, these structures of feeling that at the time are emergent, so they're 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 hard to grasp, and and even our even ourselves, we may not be aware of them, and the artist as producer might not either. And and so there's many cases of this, and actually most of the directors uh, that I'm looking at when they are when they have been questioned, and I've questioned one of them myself, uh, they they deny they deny that you know it has anything to do with 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 this sort of thing. So. Yeah, so yeah, audience reception and, and authorial intent isn't going to get my project anywhere. Um, so I'm writing <laughs> against those things for sure. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Very Thank interesting. Uh, good luck. When is the book coming out? <laughs> I hope it comes out in, uh, in a year and a half. That'd be great. Uh, yeah, maybe two, but yeah, in the near future. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. All right. Thank, thanks for your time, Vlad. Thank you, Isaac. No, don't stay up too late. Don't watch any of these films. <laughs> 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 In the afternoon. Yeah.